Okay, now today is the, uh, let's see, it's the third Sunday of the Epiphany season, and we continue reading uh, mostly about the early days of our Lord's ministry. And later on, the next season after this one will be Lent. And then we'll read about uh, later uh, parts of his ministry, which, of course, eventually it all ends up in Jerusalem. <coughs> but the text for today is very interesting. They all are, but this one. He, uh, as I'll read, he's gone back to his hometown. Jesus has gone back to his hometown, which was Nazareth. Okay, so let me start reading here in Luke chapter 4, beginning at verse 16. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and he went to the synagogue, as his custom was, on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read, and there was given to him the book of the prophet Isaiah. He opened the book and found the place where it was written. So he's reading now from the book of Isaiah. He's reading it just like we could read it today. You know, in his time, of course, they didn't have the New Testament. That wasn't written until, a, well, parts of it were written about 20, 25 years after Jesus' ministry. Uh, but most of it, a lot of it was written in the 60s some of it in the 70s, <clears throat> but the Old Testament, of course, was available. That was the Bible for the people in, during his time. So <clears throat> they gave him the Bible, and he opened it to the book of the prophet Isaiah, and he read this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he an has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. Now that's what he read from Isaiah. Then it says, and he closed the book, the Bible, and gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. And, and the eyes of all in the synagogue... <clears throat> were fixed on him. Okay? So he read this portion from their Bible. And, every, and then he sat down, and everybody was looking at him. And then he said to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Heavenly Father, I pray now that you would impart your holy word through my words and the meditations of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, you know, one of the first things that every preacher has to do, right, preacher? Where's the preacher? Right, preacher? Any other preachers? <laughs> One of the first things you have to do is what's called the exegetical task. Uh -huh. How's that for a big word? I think we learn some of those words in seminary so that we uh, can use them once in a while just to impress you. <laughs> <clears throat> but the, she's shaking her head. But the first task is the exegetical task which is to try to figure out what the text meant. What did these words of Jesus mean at the time that he spoke them? What I mean, he was in the synagogue. They gave him the Bible. He opened up to Isaiah, or maybe it was open, and then he read, and then the people sat down. They were looking at him. So what, what did it mean when this event that we're reading about took place? <coughs> And then the second task of every preacher, here's another big one, uh -huh. 
the hermeneutical test. <laughs> Are you impressed? <laughs> the hermeneutical task is to ask the question, well, what does it mean for us? See? I mean, you have to, you know, what, is, what did it mean then? Now, what does it mean for us? What is the meaning here? Because, that, you know, we're 2,000 years later. And, uh, and then the third task of every preacher is what's called the homiletical task. And that's the actual preaching of the word. Okay? Now, here's where we get into a problem. And here's where this sermon today is only going to last five minutes. So you're all going to get out of here early. <laughs> And, uh, you know, that's what you could think, though, because Jesus talks here about the poor, the captive, the blind, and the oppressed. Okay? He was talking, he was quoting Isaiah. That was written 700 years before his time, and here we are 2,000 years later. So what does it have to do with us? How many here are poor? You're not poor. <laughs> How many here are captive, blind, oppressed? You see, at first, and I, I'd be not be serious here, but you could say, well, what does this have to, to do with us? We're not poor, we're not oppressed, we're not captive. Some of us, our vision isn't very good, and there might be a few here that are near blindness, but not many of us blind. So what does this have to do with us? Well, here's what, here's, as I have tried to do the hermeneutical task, that is to figure this out, here's what I think we can and must gain from this text. We have to kind of figure out what, how, what this means for us. <clears throat> and I think the key is we have to remember that which is spiritual. <clears throat> spiritual. Yes, there's poverty. You know, the people to whom Jesus was speaking they, many of them, most of them, were really poor. I mean, they were poor, as we might normally think of the, of the term. You know, we, we give a lot of support to Genesis, which is a, a pro, the Genesis Project in Apache Junction. Over the last three years, we've given them many, many thousands of dollars. I think in the budget this year, they're down for about 14000 and we've been giving them that much or more for the last three years. Why do we do that? Because there are a lot of poor people, really poor. Uh, and they come there to get one good meal a day. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, uh, tomorrow I'm not going to go over to Genesis for my noon meal. How many, are you, any of you going? I doubt if a single one of us has ever gone to Genesis to get a decent meal. But now they're feeding up to 200 people a day. My wife and, and another lady from this congregation, they go on Friday and prepare a salad. It takes a couple, they prepare a salad, big salad bowls, for 200 people. Uh, because there are a lot of poor people, a lot of homeless people. Those are the people that go there to get a decent meal. So, I mean, we still have poor. We know that. There are, still, there are millions of very poor people in the world today. Uh, but I don't think any of them are here. I don't think any of us are really poor. Not like that. So then what does it mean? Well, there's more than just uh, economic poverty. In fact, there's a certain kind of poverty that is even worse, even more devastating. You know what it is? Spiritual poverty. Now it can speak to us. 
Because I think that we have all experienced at times spiritual poverty. Think about it. Haven't there been times in your life when you have really, uh, you, you just, I wonder what tomorrow's going to bring. Or, or you're, you're just down. Uh, you've, got, you've got children who are in trouble. Or grandchildren. Or you've got illness uh, in terms of your own life, or maybe that of your wife, or that of your husband. We've all been, or you've lost a loved one. You just, you gave me a prayer. You just lost your sister. You're thankful because she'd been ill for quite a while, but there's still sorrow. There's sorrow in the loss of a loved one. Uh, there's consternation when we're confronted by problems and troubles. You know, I bring communion to people, and yesterday I brought communion to a lady. Oh, I've known her for since I've been in Arizona. I buried her husband, and uh, <clears throat> she had four sons. Three of them have died. She has one son who lives in Iowa. And uh, so I go to see her at least once a month with communion, and sometimes I drop in, you know, just other times, and I went into her <clears throat> little place, she's in an assisted living, and that poor thing, she was struggling with her uh, oxygen machine, she has to have oxygen, and it had gotten dislocated, so it wasn't, it was, wasn't hooked up right, and uh, <clears throat> so she said, you know, maybe you can get this hooked up right. Well, you know, I'm not, uh, I, when I was young, I was strong. <laughs> when you work on a dairy farm, you grow up strong. Well, those days are gone. <laughs> but I was able to, to push it together so it worked. And then she said, well, I've got to take my blood pressure. Because she has to take it, keep track of it. And the blood pressure machine wasn't working. So we messed around with it. She said, I think it needs new batteries. She said, would you be able to go and get, it was in the afternoon before church. She said, I know you've got a service, but would you be able to go and get some batteries? I guess I'll go and get some batteries. So I ran to, that's what the farmers say, I drove. So, oh, my dad used to say, well, I better, I got to run downtown. Well, he didn't run. He got in the car. Anybody remember that? You run here. And so I ran to Walgreens, got some batteries, came back, had my glasses with me so I could see, put new batteries for them in the blood pressure machine. It worked like a charm. And then I gave her communion. I could tell you story after story after story. I was saying earlier that a lot of times when I bring communion to people, and, and I brought communion to another lady on Friday, this lady yesterday, and in both cases they were not really happy. They were kind of down. This one couldn't get her oxygen to work, couldn't get the blood pressure. The other lady was kind of discontented because she didn't like the care she was receiving. And oh, sometimes we're spiritually kind of poor. You know, we're not doing so well. I was telling B, we were talking about it. <clears throat> when I, I usually it's about an hour visit. We visit, then we have communion, then we prayer, and then we visit some more. I can't remember a single time where I have brought communion to somebody who's really down when they haven't felt a lot better at the end of the visit. And it's not about me. It's not about me. It's about what I bring them. I bring them the holy sacrament of communion. We pray. We have scripture.
And you see, that's what Jesus was talking about. He brings us, what does it say here? Uh, let me have a look here. <laughs> to preach good news to the poor. That's what I thought. To preach good news to the poor. That's what I do, and it's a privilege to bring some good news to people that aren't having a good day. Or they're sad. They're frustrated. They're lonely. I mentioned this one lady. Her only remaining son is in Iowa. And, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of people that don't get visited very often. If you know somebody that's in a nursing home or an assisted living, or if you know a neighbor that doesn't get visited very often, you go and visit them. Do it. You'll be a blessing. Jesus comes with good news when we are poor. Yes. And then it says that he comes to bring sight to those that are blind. Here again, it's not just physical blindness. That's bad enough. My dad, the last year, year and a half that he lived, he was basically blind. And his identical twin brother was totally blind for about the last four years of his life. And you, we've all known people that can't see. They're blind. I can't even imagine what that is like. You know, close your eyes for a minute and whoo. But you see, there's also spiritual blindness, isn't there? I mean, I think, and it can happen even to those of us who are believers. Sometimes we can get, I don't know, blinded. We, can, we don't see clearly. We don't see clearly. We're kind of stumbling around. Let me give you a, a, an example from my own life. I always think that's helpful. A preacher who's not willing to share... His own life or her own life shouldn't be a preacher. And not just the good parts. Dave. When I was got out of the army after service in uh, Vietnam and then service in Japan and service in this country, it was four years, I got out of the army and I went right into seminary because I'd been struggling with it. Oh. Uh, so, I did, it didn't go well. For one thing, I was the only uh, uh, Vietnam veteran. In the, there were 400 students at the seminary, and I was the only one. that had, had been. There was one other veteran, but he hadn't been in Vietnam. So I was like, I mean, there was nobody there. I, most of them didn't even know my background, because I didn't tell them. They wouldn't understand it anyway. But why did I go to seminary? after I get out of the army. Spiritual blindness. Spiritual poverty. You see, the question that was plaguing me and had been plaguing me for my whole life, even though I was only, what, 24, here's the question that plagued me. When have you done enough of what you got to do? And that has plagued a lot of you. I know it has. I've seen it. When have I done enough of what I've got to do? See, I was imprisoned to the law. I knew that, as a good Lutheran, I knew we were justified by grace through faith. I knew it up here, but I didn't know it here. I didn't know it in my heart. I know, I suppose I gotta go to seminary and try and do something, you know. To, I mean, we have all that is being in prison to the law. And there and that's where some of our preachers, I think, oh, they shouldn't be preaching. The gospel is not about what you gotta do and if you've done enough of what you gotta do. That's not the gospel. That's the law. And the law destroys, because the answer is never. You have never done enough of what you got to do to be saved. Never. 
The good news is that Jesus saves us. That's the gospel. I'm going to go to heaven when I die because of Jesus, not because of me. We sin and fall short every day. Well, so I went to seminary. At the end of the first year, I said, this isn't for me. I wasn't at peace. I was angry. I didn't know what to do. I was, oh, <clears throat> my wife and, had, wife and I by then had a son. I've been in the Army four years, four years in college. I didn't have anything. Didn't have a job. Didn't have any money. All I wanted to do was go back to the farm. Can I just go back to my cows, my Guernseys? So I went back home. We left Minnesota, drove all the way back to Washington State where the farm was. I didn't know what to do. Some of my folks and different ones said, well, why don't you just take the summer off? You can help on the farm. I can help my brother farm. And just think. And so I did. And in August, put the plain U-Haul behind the car and drive back to Minnesota, <laughs> to the seminary. And I still wasn't happy, but I didn't know what to do. And then all of a sudden, it was in late September of that second year, and all, I've told you this before, but it's true, and it's a good illustration of what I'm talking about. The first, late, I was walking from the lower campus at Luther Seminary up to the, and I was all alone. I didn't have a lot of friends there. Like I say, most of them had no idea. A lot of them were anti-war demonstrators. That was big back in that time. The war that I'd been in, man, he'd talk about the soldiers. And I didn't want to tell my experience and be called a baby killer. That was the stuff that was going on back then. When we came back, there weren't any parades. Just the opposite. So I was walking up, and all of a sudden, I was walking from lower campus to the upper campus, and all of a sudden, God spoke to me. Not audibly, but he spoke to me as I never, I've never forgotten it. It was just as clear as it could be. I was walking up, there were gold, it was in the fall, so the leaves were beginning to turn gold. It was very pretty walking up. And all of a sudden, God said to me, you don't have to be a preacher. That's what he said. And it was like the dawning of a new day. And it was then that I began to want to be. And the next, my third, uh, my, my second, third, and fourth years of seminary were great. Had a good time. You see what I'm saying? We have all been at different times impoverished spiritually and blind. But our Lord Jesus never leaves us out in the darkness. Sometimes it takes a while because some of us are kind of stubborn. And some of us, like my wife sometimes said, you know, she one time said, well, you know, you're not the brightest crayon in the box. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> but she's right. <laughs> but, and then, he, then the next one, i got to move along here, the next one, is the oppressed. Let's see, he came to, to preach good news to the poor. And uh, let me see here now. And uh, release to the captive. We can be captive to our spirit, uh, no, blindness. Now we go to, I got them mixed up. Now we go to the captives. Release to the captives, liberty to the oppressed. Okay, those two kind of go together. How many of you ever been in jail? Yeah, okay. I've been in jail and prison many times, but as a visitor. It's an awesome thing when they clang that door behind you. You're not getting out until you're done visiting. But, and here again, 
Here again, it's not, we haven't been in jail. We're not captive. The people to whom Jesus was speaking were captive and oppressed. Wow, you know, here in America, we have no idea what that's like, to live under occupation. Most countries, uh, in most places, they, there's been occupation. I remember hearing stories about my relatives in Norway who lived under... Norway was occupied from uh, April of 1940 to May of 1945, one of the longest occupied countries during World War II. The people during Jesus' time were under occupation by the Romans. They didn't have freedom. They didn't have anything like us. Plus, in some ways, they were also oppressed by their own religion which was a religion of the law. The scribes and the Pharisees, boy, you better not step out of line or you were in big trouble. Jesus comes to preach release to the captive like he came to me. You don't gotta, you don't gotta do this or gotta do that or you haven't done enough of it and shame on you and all that stuff. That's not the gospel. Jesus comes. He comes to me and he comes to you when we're like the lost little sheep. You ever been lost? Yes, you have. We've all been lost at different times, spiritually. And maybe physically, too. But spiritual is much more serious. But he comes... He loves us so much. He, remember the old, uh, in, the, in the parable in Luke chapter 15, three great parables. Read them. Lost sheep, lost coin, and lost son. Read them this afternoon, those three. Luke chapter 15. But the little sheep. And then there was a song, 99. There were 99 that safely lay in the shelter of the fold. But he counted them. See, the good shepherd counts. And 99 is not enough. You know, uh, for some, wow, missing one, so what? He goes searching for the lost sheep. In seminary, I just thought of this right now, but in seminary, I was lost. <clears throat> maybe, there, maybe the other 400 students understood what in the world was going on, although I don't think they did. <laughs> some. Al Rodness, who was president of the seminary, when I went through, he said something else I'll never forget. He said, you shouldn't become a preacher unless you have to. Very interesting. My Lord knew that that's what I, that's what I had to be. But I had to want. Well, so the little lost sheep and that good shepherd, he looks all over. He's looking here until he finds it. Oh. I remember again at the farm. Sometimes a little calf would get, the, the cow would have her calf and, and there was some forest on the edge of the pasture. In our, we had a beautiful farm in Washington. Great dairy country. Better than Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> It's not so cold. <laughs> but sometimes the cow would have her calf, and she'd hide the calf across the creek in the woods. I've told you this before, but it's... And so when he, we came to get the cows to bring them in to be milked, we could tell she had a calf. You can tell when a cow has had a calf, but the calf wasn't there. Well, it's a cross that's over in the wooded area. So my dad and I would go searching for the calf. Remember? If you've got a little calf that's lost in the woods, there's only one way to find it. You've got to go walking along like this. Moo. <laughs> really, I'm not kidding. My dad and I, wandering around in the woods going moo. And pretty soon the calf would answer. Uh, then we found her. It'd be underneath. The cow hid her little calf under a branch or a little log. And I remember, oh, I remember like it was yesterday. It was great. 
I, like I said, I was strong, young, healthy, and I'd pick that calf up. It weighed about 50 pounds, and I'd carry it out. Then the cow would come up. She didn't like that. But... <laughs> That's what the good shepherd did. He found a little lamb, and he picks the little lamb up in his arms. And he carries the little lamb. Just think, if he hadn't found it, the wolves might have found it. But he carries this little lamb back to the shelter. And there's a fence, you know. Then he, he lifts the little lamb and he puts it gently down with the other lambs. That's the gospel. Jesus comes to preach good news to the poor. He comes to give sight to the blind. <clears throat> He comes to release the captive and to set free those who are oppressed. And that's all of us. We've all been here. I hate to say it. It ain't over. It ain't over. I see people, not every day, but almost, <clears throat> like the people I bring communion to. I see people in hospitals. I see people in assisted living. I see people in nursing homes. I see people still in their homes. <clears throat> They're in tough shape. They're lonely. The love of their life is gone. And they're alone and their kids are back in Iowa or Minnesota or somewhere. Yes, I could tell story after story after story. So it ain't over yet. My wife has to go to her doctor tomorrow, her cardiologist. She's got to have her pacemaker, uh, a new one put in, or batteries or something. And she's not here. I wouldn't say this because it would upset her but you know if I ever lost her if it ever got to me got to be me by myself I don't know if I could handle it. well the truth is I couldn't but my savior would help me isn't that right like he's helped many of you. So many of you. He's been there. And he'll always be there.